conversations with so many people. Uh, and uh, yay, I get to just talk some more. Um, so as uh, Daniel mentioned, I work for a small, we're like 15 people, a biotech startup spun out of Stanford called Informatics. So our CEO is both a clinician and a practicing uh, informatician who cares deeply about uh, diagnosing infection. Now, we focus primarily now on kind of Western problems in terms of infectious disease, but we have a much grander vision for where this should go. And we want to involve all stakeholders because, you know, I, I'm really indebted to Timnit and, and Neil for bringing up the issues that we think about all the time. Uh, generalizability, representation of populations, uh, accuracy in our downstream predictions, and also accounting for uncertainty in them. These are things we take very seriously because the decisions we make can mean the difference between life or death. So with that very dour opening, I want to talk about problems here uh, related to infectious disease because to be f quite frank, I didn't know them. I had to take a lot of time to read uh, through this report from the World Health Organization, which was authored by a collection of, of uh, field workers uh, and, uh, and uh, editorialized here by Dr. Luis Gomez, uh, Gomez Sambo from Angola, uh, called The Health of the People, What Works? And in it, he detailed uh, a number of, of issues, not just challenges that are faced, but things that are actually working to, to address them. So I just wanna highlight some of these challenges here because they were very eye-opening for me and very related to the work we do. Uh, first is, I'm just gonna rattle off statistics, but, but some of them really are quite, they were striking to me. So eight of the 10 countries with the highest rates of tuberculosis, which is a kind of bacterial infection, uh, are from countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, in 2012, there were roughly 207 million cases of malaria, which is, is another infectious disease. 80% uh, of them were concentrated in this region. Uh, lower respiratory infections uh, are actually the leading cause of disease burden. It's nothing else. It's you know, you have some kind of infection in your, in your upper respiratory tract. And this last one, which definitely is being taken seriously uh, in, in Western contexts, but now even uh, still in, in African, is this idea of drug resistance. So the antibiotics that we hit these infections with aren't working anymore. Uh, so this, I was just astounded by, that multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. So tuberculosis strains that cannot be beaten by multiple versions of, of the antibiotics we conventionally use uh, have these kinds of cases have increased nearly 200 fold in roughly a decade. Now this is, this is important for, for treatment of these diseases, for keeping them down uh, and for allowing these communities to thrive. So how are these challenges being met? So the report wasn't all bad news, it was actually very uplifting. Uh, and two points I wanna itemize here on why, on what's particularly working, how it relates to what we do. First is how new vaccines are working. Now we don't work in vaccines, but it relates to infectious disease. These programs have really helped with uh, controlling uh, infectious uh, disease rates, particularly in these conditions I've, I've mentioned here. But what's per germane to what we do at Inflammatics is that in a number of these cases, tuberculosis and malaria in particular, they could attribute decline in rates and better treatment to improved diagnostics, improved ability to recognize and properly triage a patient, patient with an infection. Um, this is entirely what we do. So I'll get into a little bit more about, about our work and our mission uh, in a moment. I just wanted to kind of uh, respect the context first. The other thing that uh, Dr. Sambo mentioned here that I won't read the whole quote, but essentially he was saying that good data and data informed decision making is driving a lot of this improvement and will be necessary going forward to continue this progress. These are two things we keep very much at the foremost of our minds in, in the work we do. So um, I want to say that uh, I actually did not know who Sandile uh, Kubeka is. He's one of the youngest doctors in Africa. He's 22. He's an OBGYN from South Africa. And so I, I picked this picture because I was quite uh, impressed um, and uh, I wanted to use him as a model for an interaction here between a doctor and a patient. How would we find an infection? Um, so these are the things in the process that are currently very flawed and, and apply everywhere. This is not just a Western context. So initial diagnosis, when a patient sees you, is driven mostly by physiological symptoms. How do you feel, right? You got a sniffling note, you, you know, look at me. 
they hear me with a raspy voice, they hear me coughing, you know, they'll take my temperature, they'll want to know if I have a fever. They don't really know what's going on inside me. So it's not a very specific measure of infection. It's a proxy, okay? Not a perfect one. Generally, it's good enough. Now, if they have the intuition, which most clinicians would, to go order lab cultures, so maybe to take a sample from your throat and go put that on a, an addition, see what grows, then they could know what antibiotics to use. The trouble is it can take days for that answer to come back. And for some people with very severe infections, that's not fast enough. And lastly, antibiotics can just be sometimes administered without real thought to the consequences. I could have a fever, like I probably do, because I have a cold, from a virus, not because of bacteria. Antibiotics aren't gonna do anything to a virus. And so hitting me with antibiotics not only won't help me, it might hurt me because it's breeding that antibiotic resistance that I was talking about previously. So what do we do at Inflamatics? This is kind of a, a rough sketch of what we're trying to do. I can't say that we're in the market yet, we're trying to get there. Um, we're trying to detect any infection from patient blood within roughly 20 to 30 minutes using our in-house built rapid assay platform. So we're trying to build this device and uh, we're trying to not just predict you know, whether you have an infection, but what type it is. Because the clinician clearly needs to know whether it's viral or bacterial at minimum so they don't just give you antibiotics indiscriminately. Uh, and so the, this last piece of the, the pipeline and what we do is really where I live. It's taking the information that's extracted from the patient blood. So here we actually extract from patient blood RNAs that are measuring, uh, if you were at the summer school, uh, we talked about RNA-seq. We don't necessarily do that, but we're looking at expression of gene markers for infection. We, pull, we pile all that up into, a, into a, basically a CSV file, and we try to predict there what infection type you have, how severe your infection is, and whether an infection is even there. So how do we use data science and informatics? So you know, how do we use these gene expression values to predict uh, infection? I'm not gonna talk so much about the performance of what we do. I'm gonna talk more about the issues that we face that are so similar to things that Tindit and Neil have mentioned. They're pervasive in data science and they're even more so in medicine. Heterogeneity is key. Representation of your population is key. If I build a model built mostly on patients from Texas. I don't think it's gonna work very well on patients from Maryland or Canada or Senegal or anywhere else because not everyone is the same. We know this molecularly, physiologically, genetically. They're not all the same. We have to respect this heterogeneity and make sure that when we design this product, we have the representation of the population we want to serve in mind. So what I'm showing you here is a, is a TSNI embedding uh, on the left, this is just the first two dimensions of the embedding of all of our current training data. It all fits in a screen, so that should tell you this is not a big data problem. Um, and I've colored it in here on the right with the different classes. So what you can see, I hope, is that, so red is, is for viral infections, blue is bacterial, and yellow is for what we call sterile inflammation. So you have all the signs of an inflammatory response, but you have no infection. You'll see right away that the viral samples don't cluster. A viral sample is not a viral sample. You come in with the, to me with a viral infection, you're not gonna necessarily be like the one next to you. So we have to respect that heterogeneity in what we do. More so, so this is an even more complex version of that same diagram. That heterogeneity manifests itself in where the, the samples were collected, how they were collected, the technical platform that was used to assay the gene expression. So what I'm, I, I'm, I'm showing you here are colored points, these same samples, but from all the different studies we've used to pull together to build our training data. So you can see these studies are very different, right? They're not clustering in the same places. This whole bit on the bottom was bacterial infection, but they're all over. So we have to keep this in mind uh, as we build our models. So a second way that we use data science is in basically getting a sense for what we can do in this problem. By that, I mean, we take just conventional machine learning techniques uh, to get a sense to benchmark our predictive performance. So here I've just laid out the candidate model types we've considered. And we keep this loop. It must be a loop. As I mentioned yesterday in my summer school, with a data science exercise, you build a model, it doesn't stop there. You have to go back 
you have to see if there's something you missed. So that's what this uh, novel model here uh, at the end of the box is, 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 is pointing out. We search for model hyperparameters, so we do some kind of optimization. But we want to find those that generalize well. So that's what this bottom bit is for. We, we expose our model, our model candidates to rigorous cross-validation. And then, on top of that, we do an additional validation in a patient data set we've never seen before. You know, so we're trying to acquire new data all the time to know that our models do generalize well. We don't just stop with the training data. Now this is just uh, to give you a sense of the benchmarking we've done so far. It happened to be that neural networks won out here, and that's gonna be important because we didn't wanna just stop with neural networks. We wanted to go back up this loop to see if there was more information we could incorporate uh, in our modeling. Um, but I just, again, wanna point out the fact that this would not have been possible, this work, without this attention to generalizability, making sure that our models extrapolated well to data they hadn't seen before. So these two steps in this process were, were, are very key to what we do. So as I, as I said, um, a, part, a part of what we do is incorporating insights we have uh, from clinicians and, and also just the data itself to help us develop new, new models and potentially better models. This is not a black box. And what's great about being in a small data problem is that you can do things like this. You can do more custom model building. That's why I like this space, is that I don't just kind of throw at data and expect it to come up with predictions. I can actually go back to it. So here, the inputs at the bottom of this neural network diagram are our different gene names for our panel of markers that we care about. We can go back to this. And, in, and indeed, we found that there's ways to connect these genes that correspond to how they act in different aspects of the condition. So these three genes, for example, we know are highly expressed in fever, whereas another set of genes might be highly expressed if you have severe infection. And by pooling them in this way, almost akin to a CompNet, we extract better information for our predictions. We don't just stop with the predictions either. So this is relatively new work, but work that I've been banging on my, my colleagues to do because I'm, I'm a trained Bayesian statistician. And you kind of never leave that field, even if you may want to. It, it stays with you, as, as Neil can probably attest. So what I'm showing you here are posterior predictive distributions. All this really means is when I predict an infection for you and its probability, I don't just give you a single number. I say that there's a distribution over it. So there's some uncertainty with that estimate. Um, and so on the left is for a bacterial sample. I apologize if you can't read this. Uh, the blue is the same color. If these are, this is for a bacterial sample. Red and yellow for, are for um, a viral and non-infected. So for this, on the left side, you had a bacterial sample. All the predictive probability here is piling up around one. That's what we want. Good. But on the right, what I'm showing uh, is a contrast between incorporating uncertainty and these vertical lines here, which are actually point estimate based approach. So if I just trained a model and predicted without incorporating uncertainty, that model would have told you that this is a bacterial infection. Whereas incorporating uncertainty here has allowed for the possibility that this is a viral infection. So you see that red probability is piling up around one. This would have helped a person from getting antibiotics they didn't need. So, I'm just going to wrap this up because I know, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going. Um, we're always looking for collaborators. So if you're a clinician or a scientist who's working with a clinician, we would love to hear with you. We're actually acquiring a number of samples for our, our FDA pivotal trials in Africa. We have collaborators in Malawi. We have collaborators in Nigeria. And we're always looking for more, more folks who can help us acquire new data. Uh, and secondly, we'd love to discuss ideas for promote, performing remote data science work with us. Just at this stage, I would love to just have a conversation. We can't necessarily set up anything yet. We're a very small company, as I said. But I would love to hear thoughts on this, because I think remote connections are, are really going to help bridge this gap. The fact that I'm standing here, I have to tell you, is a very humbling and important experience uh, for me. I feel like we should be talking together all the time. Um, and yet we don't, for just silly reasons. So you know, uh, let's, let's keep these connections going. Um, I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. I can be reached at my email address. Uh, that's my Twitter handle is, is Data Forager. And, uh, and on LinkedIn as well, I'm happy to connect with you. So thanks very much. Thank you very much.
Matthew. Uh, one question, please, and then we'll, uh, we'll take our next presentation. Uh, presentation from Lindy. Maybe you'd like to come up and set up while, you know, uh, while we... One question. Uh, and please remember, if you have any comments, complaints, compliments, you know, please put them up on our Twitter uh, handle or on our Facebook. Or and. Uh, any one question? Yes, we have a question here. Yeah, so we, <coughs> sorry, in terms of gender diversity, it's, it's a fairly good split. There's actually uh, more women than men. Uh, in terms of regional diversity, we've got samples from, who, let me see if I can remember all of them, uh, Thailand. Um, we've got samples from, I think we do have samples from Malawi, Australia. Um, we've got some from the UK. We've got some from uh, the US. We've got some from, hmm, there's one other, there's someone that, somewhere in the Middle East, I want to say. I, can't, I, I apologize, I can't remember. There's like 19 studies in our training data. Um, but yes, we, we do try very hard, and we're always trying harder to, to uh, increase that diversity. Big round of applause for uh, 